Well, welcome to the MATC seminar. Uh, today we have Lonnie Birkeland, who's uh, uh, just been named Assistant Director for Transportation, Public Works, and Utilities uh, in the last year. He, previous to that, he was Manager of Traffic Engineering at, at the City of Lincoln, and previous to that, he worked for a number of consulting firms, inclu including Olson Associates and ITERIS. Uh, I've asked them today to come talk about some of the innovative stuff they're doing at the city, and, uh, and I'm, we're happy to have them here. So, Lonnie? Okay. Yeah. Well, don't, don't clap yet, right? You haven't even seen the show, so. Uh, how's everybody doing? Good, glad it's Friday, me too. Uh, we've had a fun-filled week at the City of Lincoln, but happy to be here. Um, so, we'll have a little bit of fun. Uh, I'm gonna walk through some of the projects, some ongoing things we're doing at the City of Lincoln. Um, talk about a couple initiatives that have been kind of near and dear to my heart with uh, signal system things. I've got a ton of information. I'll try to blitz through some of it. I want to reserve a little bit of time. So if you have any questions at all about uh, other things transportation related or things in the city of Lincoln or, um, you know, if you need a job or anything like that, we'll just, uh, we'll reserve some time so you guys can ask questions and, um, I'll see if I can at least answer them. So um, gonna talk a little bit about uh, future of transportation also and kind of how we're trying to make Lincoln ready for some of the wave of this uh, craziness with connected vehicles and autonomous vehicles. And I don't know, did anybody see some of the things we were doing with the shuttle at Innovation Campus? Yeah, head nods, okay. Um, so that was interesting for us as well too. Um, talk a little bit about roundabouts and one or two uh, kind of cool projects we're about to embark on next year. Um, and some other things that we're doing that we're seeing changes in, in transportation and just with the community of Lincoln uh, a little bit as well and kind of what's important to folks and um, how we've kind of needed to adjust our program a little bit and, and prioritize things. So, and then a lot about, uh, uh, a lot about technology. So, other thing is, this is one of my new favorite sayings because at the city of Lincoln, um, once in a while it feels like we're doing some crazy things and whatever, but I always tell our staff, you know, stop being afraid of what could go wrong. Start being excited about what could go right. Because once in a while, as many of you know, as engineers, we don't like to jump off cliffs and we don't even like to follow other people that jump off cliffs. So uh, sometimes we're a little bit different crowd and that's okay. Um, but what I've learned in my short time at the city is that in order to kind of step into some of this innovative work, um, sometimes it's important to take risks a little bit and we don't try to beat up our staff for taking risks and even failing once in a while if they do that, right? That's how we keep kind of pushing the envelope and, and doing things that are, that are really cool and innovative and, and make a difference. So, um, so some of the things that we're doing now, um, these concepts a lot when we're doing neighborhood plans and when we're getting inquiries about um, street improvements and, and safety and things, this uh, complete streets world is, is really um, coming full focus for us. There's a lot of new national guidance out about better and smarter ways to design intersections, um, make better use of the street area that's there um, for cyclists, pedestrians, um, a lot of traffic calming requests that we get. A lot of things transit oriented design now. Um, you know, it used to be sort of these big city issues and problems in downtown Minneapolis or San Fran or all over. And, you know, a lot of that culture, a lot of those young people, a lot of the innovative folks that are wanting to stay and hang around Lincoln because it is growing and prospering, um, they're more interested about a lot of those types of things and transportation as a service. Uh, type issues. So um, that's a lot of what we've been doing. You know, everything starts out, we always got to have a plan. So we're, we're always going back to these previous master plans. And this is just an example of, you know, UNL campus master plan that has driven some recent things we did out here on Vine Street and 16th, 17th um, over the last year or so. But uh, we have a long range transportation plan, our LRTP, we call it. So lots of sort of crystal balling and work going on in the background, trying to plan for projects that are two, five, 10, 
even maybe 20 years down the road. And that's starting to be a little bit more of a challenge. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, so this is a shot of some of the bike lanes and things through campus, the converted 16th Street. Um, if you've been around UNL for a while, um, you know that was a change. Uh, we worked with the university a lot on this and with our planning department and talked about um, sort of ways to hopefully get more traffic to use the periphery of campus and not cut through so much. And this was another example of one of those projects that was changes in traffic control, making accommodations for bicyclists, pedestrian safety. Um, we're probably not done out here yet with continuing to monitor and make adjustments and do things. But, um, you know, as we look at some of these streets and even downtown streets with multi lanes and um, kind of thinking about different ways we can be doing things in the future, there's definitely certain stretches and, and streets that we built in this community 50 years ago uh, that have plenty of capacity. Um, and there's other areas that don't and ones that we need to widen and do different things. But um, that was an example of a, uh, of a project that, um, you know, from an analysis standpoint was sort of a no brainer to us, but in terms of the messaging and things and newspaper articles and council meetings and, oh my gosh, getting emails from um, even some of our own professors and people here that didn't necessarily love us. Boy, I don't know that I, even I was ready for the onslaught of what a big deal it was gonna be to you know, convert a one-way street to a two-way street and take out a couple traffic signals. So um, sometimes it's like we're taking people's birthday away. It's a, it's a big deal. Um, another one that was not necessarily lacking some controversy that we've been forging ahead with. In fact, we've got plans here about October 21st, 22nd, if mother nature cooperates is uh, we did a complete street study and looking at a conversion of 13th street from downtown about Lincoln mall all the way down to South street. So there's kind of a South of downtown neighborhood uh, that this four lane undivided street runs through with double yellow down the middle. It's a four lane street. Um, at most it carries in segments about uh, 9,000 ADT. Um, we're gonna convert that to a three lane street with a center two way left turn lane. We're gonna dramatically improve the safety. Oh, by the way, we've got extra space. So we're gonna stripe some bike lanes, um, which of course, again, not everyone is in love with. Um, so those are those things as we kind of design and lay out and analyze these projects. These were just some snapshots of cut sheets and things that we had to put out on the website and have neighborhood meetings and go um, sort of vet these things with folks. But what was interesting is when, when we talked about um, this existing section of 13th Street from the downtown to South Street, which is what is shown in orange, we reminded folks that the current stretch of 13th Street from south down to Van Dorn is already a three lane street with a center two way left turn lane. Um, by the way, the traffic volumes are about 40% more on the street that apparently doesn't have enough lanes, but it carries 40% more traffic. And oh, by the way, the crash rate of this four lane street that is really wonderful to some has a crash rate of seven versus two and a half. So just more than three times. Um, so when we really start to mine data and share data and use our engineering judgment and everything that we learned right here at this great institution, I went here too, it's a good place. Um, you know, you can put these things together and let people realize that, hey, I guess maybe this will work. And um, so anyway, we're gonna go do this here in a couple of weeks and I've told people if it's an epic failure, all we're really doing is removing some stripes and we're gonna put it in in paint, not even permanent thermo um, or polyurea markings. So if we really made a bad boo-boo, we can go scrub it off and repaint it as four lanes. It'll be okay. Um, but this thing, as far as being one of the least inexpensive projects our public works department will do all year, it is probably the most important project we will do all year based on the amount of press and drama and council and neighborhood input and everyone else. So um, we can spend 2 million, 10 million, 20 million doing projects that 
seem like a really big deal. And once in a while for about $80,000 of striping and thinking about some pedestrian crosswalk amenities and things, um, you can create a project that um, because of some of that public uh, input and things is, is way more important than that. So um, kind of other cool things, complete streets and downtown and modernization, things that are going on from a study standpoint, the downtown master plan is going to be wrapping up very soon. Um, they're gonna have a few more public meetings. The consultants are putting together a report, but it's really kind of talking about what is the future of downtown and livability and more residential units in downtown Lincoln. Um, we're quickly wrapping up a citywide on-street bike master plan. So looking at the current and future system, where should we have bike lanes? Where should we not have bike lanes? What about protected bike lanes, separated bike lanes, buffered bike lanes, design standards for such? Um, Lots and lots of great information is being put together in a new plan that'll soon be wrapped up um, from that standpoint as well. So a lot of cool work going on in that realm. So I'll shift gears a little bit and talk about my favorite intersection type, which is roundabouts, because circles are better than squares. Um, you know, donuts are even yummier than those square cinnamon rolls. There's lots and lots of things. Um, People with round heads are better than people with block heads. Um, there's lots of good reasons why circles work better. But in terms of traffic and moving uh, transportation facilities, a lot of it is because of this reduction in conflict points. And roundabouts, roundabouts, roundabouts used to be more controversial. Thank God I wasn't at the city 10 years ago, only about four years ago. Some of that is kind of... Um, overcome. We didn't help ourselves probably early on with a couple locations that we tried to force fit. Um, but we're getting there and we're doing more of these. In fact, we've got over 50 roundabouts in the city right now. When I say that number, most people are like, what? Where are they? But they're there, trust me. Um, we're building another probably five or six this season, probably at least got that many planned next season. A lot of our new development projects out on the fringe. Uh, I've been reviewing design plans for at least about a dozen more roundabouts. So we are doing more and more roundabouts. In fact, it's our first form of traffic control um, because they're safer, they're more efficient. Under most traffic volume conditions, they significantly outperform a traffic signal. Um, they reduce 90% of fatalities, 75% of injuries, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 50% of all crash types. So um, I'll take those stats every time and that doesn't matter if it's in Lincoln or Kansas or across America or across the world. Roundabouts are king. And if you don't like roundabouts, sorry, we're doing a bunch more of them. Um, this is an interesting project if you're familiar with Southwest Lincoln at all. So down at 14th and Warwick and Old Cheney, this thing has about a 20 year history with uh, crashes and a, and a pretty poor um, safety record and an operational performance record. Um, when I was a consultant a lot of years ago, um, I worked on a design competition even for this project. People have been trying to figure out this area for a really long time. Um, we're moving forward. It feels like it's been a turtle, maybe even a snail, but we're finally moving forward with a very big project to redo the world out here. Um, it is actually an elevated roundabout. I tell people it's kind of just an urban interchange. Um, it's got some ramp junctions. It's got an intersection that goes underneath. Again, some people have sort of maybe blown this out of proportion a little bit, like it's some big, huge, scary thing, but I'm here to tell you it's not. Um, but it is pretty cool. Um, so this is looking north here. So Warlick Boulevard that comes in from the southwest, you'll be able to continue right up and through and, and go through a, a T intersection, simple two-phase signal. Um, it's gonna work really well. It's gonna pump a lot of traffic through. There's a few movements that are even redundant where you can come up and go through the roundabout. Um, but again, it's really about with the consultants that have been working on this and the design about reducing conflict points, improving the safety, improving the operations. Um, oh, by the way, making it much more aesthetically pleasing and it will be a nice amenity for the community. So what you see here is kind of a rendering 
um, again, sort of looking to the northeast of, of what that'll be. So a lot of design challenges, some pretty cool bridge sections, some things like that, where we're running conduits and how do we do signing and some of the directional stuff, right? Um, some of the cool ITS work, we're still going to put some camera poles out here and some things like that. So um, it's going to be an interesting project. I've got, I think if this works, yeah. So this has been, uh, gosh, there was like three alternatives that were sort of vetted through different design teams um, probably six or seven years ago. And I was a consultant on one of those teams. My option lost, by the way, it wasn't this cool. Uh, it was a little more pragmatic. It would have worked too, but, uh, but, I, but I'm fine. I'm over that. This is the winner. So um, now being on the public side, we get to um, sort of follow along and help manage this. And it's going to start with some utility relocates uh, this next season in 2019. And then we're going to move into full on construction into uh, kind of end of 19 and into 2020. So it's going to be a big project, a uh, pretty cool project. This is some video again that the, the team put together for some of that outreach, for some of the public information meetings that we went to, just to sort of give folks a perspective. You know, when you look at a design like this on paper, uh, it's one thing. When you look at a design like this, like you're driving through it, like this nice little orange car, obviously it gives you a totally different perspective. So um, we unveiled a lot of this stuff down at Lincoln Southwest and have had lots of lots of public meetings and input. Um, and it's gone pretty well. Uh, Felsberg, Holt and Ulavig, FHU was a consultant that's kind of been the lead on this. You may have seen other presentations. They've been out kind of doing their own uh, tour and sharing lots of information. They even had some virtual reality goggles where you could walk through the project, which was pretty impressive for some of the reporters and things to put on. So that's the kind of level of effort now as designers and engineers and consultants that we hire that some of these types of projects just simply require. Um, so it's been pretty interesting. Um, Greenlight Lincoln. So when Lonnie came to the city uh, right at the start of 2014, one of the big missions I was on right away was to help upgrade some of our 1980s-ish traffic signal system infrastructure. Um, it was rough. Uh, we still have a lot of aged equipment and some intersections and things that need replaced, but it's a lot better than it was. Um, we started in on a traffic management master plan that we developed. Um, we kind of redid the whole world and the landscape in terms of creating a database of information about what we know about our 430 traffic signals and our couple hundred miles of communications conduit and fiber media and wireless systems. Um, what I learned right away is we had a lot of paper and binders full of sort of kind of knowledge of about what's out there. And as I worked with our signal shop and a few of our other engineers said, okay, time out. Has anybody heard of GIS and things like that? So um, we started putting in everything we knew about every traffic signal cabinet location and controller and components and bits and pieces. And we now have this wonderful database of everything, everything, everything about every location. And then we said, okay, what are the gaps in that system? Well, there was a lot. We had about 40% of our detection systems that were failed and broken. Um, can't do a lot of amazing signal timing when your vehicle detection systems aren't even working. Um, so we kind of fought hard for some funding. We reprioritized things and we dove into this Greenlight Lincoln initiative all with a plan basically to um, fix our intersections, improve a lot of hardware, software, uh, detection systems, we did a lot of fixes with um, all of these wonderful partners, consultants helping us retime things, electrical contractors in the field in addition to our own staff, and we improved signal head displays. Um, we moved some things around on mast arms. We've been installing signs. Uh, the goal has really been, uh, I've told the guys, take me out to an intersection, blindfold me, spin me around, and when I open the cabinet, I don't want to know where I'm at. I want every single thing to look the same, smell the same, feel the same, be the same. Because that's how you operate things in a consistent manner. That's how you're able to show up at 2 a.m. when um, a driver knocks something over in the field and hits a cabinet. And you know what you're doing and what you're looking at. 
So we have gotten rid of lots of uh, mice nests and duct taped things and stuff that is, um, I can't even tell you the, 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 the craziness that we probably had out in the field in this supposed high tech city. So uh, phase one, we installed a lot of flashing yellow arrows. We fixed about 120 intersections on nine of our busiest streets. Um, we had an awesome benefit cost ratio. Uh, we did a lot of before and after travel time runs and the consultants rolled up and talked about number of stops and hours of delay and based on the traffic volumes, the environmental benefits, right? So we spent a little bit of money on a project like this and we touched intersections in all areas of the community. Um, and it was really pretty cool and it's continued to justify uh, our program. I'll show you this real quick as an example, just because a lot of times we have people that don't believe us. So we did some in-car video comparisons. Um, we basically did a side-by-side -side comparison. So we got in a car before condition and after condition. Where were we turning light screen? What were we doing? I'll spare you some of the, the details, but we did this on every corridor in each direction for different times of the day, right? So we started to, to get really um, tricky with how we were displaying and showing these things. So if you look down here, this is the O Street corridor. And so here's our after condition car in green, the date we did it, the time, here's our before car in red. And we did this in each direction. We said, see here, look, here's in-car video with the new signal timing plans. Um, and this is what we did. So when you start again to roll up real data, not fake news, um, this is what we spent your money on. This is what we did. This is what the result was. Um, the after condition is here. So it's amazing what happens when you put in detection systems that work and you update signal timing plans and you use all that great engineering knowledge from University of Nebraska, um, which several of our consultants are from here too. They're really sharp guys. Um, and it works. So we just keep doing this and we're in phase two now, um, which is going pretty well also. So Greenlight Lincoln is moving forward. I think phase two is about another, oh gosh, uh, dozen or so corridors and about another 140 or 50 intersections. So when we get done with this phase three, which we're kicking in next year will be the CBD area. So downtown, which is, scary because we talk about old signals with old poles and mast arms and metal conduits and asbestos stuff that's underground and things that are crushed and fail and old copper connection. Uh, we have a lot to do uh, with construction work and installing new pole boxes and things like that in order to connect to our new technology. Uh, we're just about ready to put an RFP on the street for our new software finally. Um, and our 450 new controllers. We hope that'll go out maybe even next week. Um, so we're going to get into a whole new technology lift that we can then put some of these new timing plans and things in and, and roll that out over this next spring and um, connected vehicle modules, adaptive signal timing modules. Uh, it's gonna get us into a whole new world of, of potential. So that's gonna be really awesome for us. Okay. I'll keep moving. <clears throat> How's everybody doing? Head nods, all right, mostly. So, <clears throat> future trends, crazy stuff that's going on in transportation. Reemergence. it's like this little guy, this little tree growing out of the old, old tree stump, right? That's where we're at right now in our industry. It's kind of crazy. Um, there's a few driving factors out there that are really molding things. Um, but we like to share some of this somewhat scary, somewhat really advanced things, because this stuff is, is here and it's coming and it's coming fast and it's what makes our job sort of difficult right now when we think of 10-year plans and 20-year plans, right? Hyperloop, things that will be here, getting from LA to Las Vegas in a half hour instead of like four hours, right? Game changer, disruptive technology, uh, those things are here. This mag levitation train stuff they're playing with in China and Europe. Uh, high speed, moving lots of people, right? 
things that will be game changers. Uh, hypersonic flight. It's like a George Jetson thing. Probably guys don't even know what the Jetsons are, right? I'm, I'm okay. Old cartoons, futuristic stuff. Uh, jumping in an airplane that travels 3,000 miles an hour and getting from like New York to London in under an hour, okay? Think of what that's like. Hey, honey, I'll be back home. What are you making for supper? I'm going to London to the office. I'll be back. Right? We don't even think like that today, but that will happen. That will be a thing. You guys will get to do that. Um, I might, but I'll be even grayer. Uh, but it's coming soon. Um, some of this personal manned aircraft things and drone flights, all the other crazy experimental type stuff um, is not so crazy and experimental anymore. Um, charging stations for your phone, charging pads for cars, Electric vehicles uh, are on a huge uptick. Um, many of you will have those. Um, these personal pods, not too distant from what we're working on with our autonomous shuttle project, uh, right? Personal people movers, a lot of downtown, residential living, and how are we gonna move folks uh, in the future? When you think about the impacts of current streets, current transportation infrastructure, and this wave of all this technology, um, it's going to cause us to change the way we design, the way we plan, the way we analyze, uh, lots of that. And a couple big reasons this stuff is not going away. Uh, one of them is safety, okay? One of the reasons you're hearing so much about connected vehicles and autonomous vehicles and all that is because of this right here. We kill 40,000 people every year just in the US in our cars because a lot of us are on our phones. A lot of us are playing crash them up, bang them up. Um, and it's human error, right? More than 90% of it, it's, it's us that are driving cars and causing that problem. Um, it's the equivalent of three full commercial airplanes crashing and killing everybody every week, right? So you think if the airline industry had fully loaded airplanes crashing and killing everybody every week, that there would be change in that industry? Of course there would, right? So we've kind of become a little bit mundane and just, you know, kind of tuned that out because it's just, it's just a thing. Car crashes are just a thing, but um, it's the reason there's a huge impact to that. And when you look globally, it's even worse. So 1.3 million people, so 3,200 deaths every day. So four people in America, while I'm sitting here talking to you for this hour, are going to die in a car crash. Right now in America, four of them will, during this hour that I'm talking to you, because it's just so prevalent. But we don't think about it. Um, lots of crazy stats up here. I always remind people of this one for our young people. It's the leading cause of death, vehicle crashes. It's not cancer and other big scary things. It's vehicle crashes. So that's why this technology is so important. That's why the transportation engineering industry is so important because it's to fix this. So the other thing that's gonna get crazy and the other reason why this type of technology is not going to go away is because there is a huge amount of money to be made with connected devices, connected vehicles, connected to you, um, maybe connected to your bank account. That's scary, huh? Um, so we're talking about cars here very soon, uh, everything, numbers of devices that are connected to the internet that will know your likes and your dislikes, might even know your blood type and your vital signs. So if you are in a crash, the EMTs already show up. They know your name. They know everything about you. The hospital already has your records. They're ready for you, okay? That kind of technology will help save additional lives. But it's not just that, it's when you're getting off at the interchange and they know that you have an affinity for craft beer and burgers with a certain type of cheese. You're gonna get pop-up ads, 20% off on this burger with the jalapeno cheese because I know you like it, right? That's the kind of stuff that the big marketers and everybody are talking about, transportation industry. Um, by 2020, so cars built that will be able to connect to the internet, it's already three-fourths of them. So, I mean, that's a thing, that's coming. All the big auto manufacturers are rolling that off already, okay? Um, 
cybersecurity, which I'm not even going to go into, is a huge field too. Talk about a growing field that's going to impact transportation networks, cybersecurity. This is probably the other thing that's gotten really crazy. Um, it's kind of fun for me just because uh, I used Uber for the first time about three or four years ago when I was in Chicago and I was blown away and I was like, wow, I didn't really think this would be that easy, but it is. So this shows you right now. So this is how much we trust people, right? Percentage of respondents in a survey who think the following groups are trustworthy. So 90% of us trust our rideshare driver. 90%. And I'll tell you why is because if you're a frequent user, it works and it's just easy, right? And you step out and you get in and you do your thing and you talk to the guy or gal and then you get out, boom, and, and you do that. And it's trustworthy and it's an awesome system that works. So why not? So 58% of us think our colleagues are trustworthy. That's interesting. 42% think your neighbors are trustworthy. How about down here, 16% politicians, of course, right? Um, but yeah, 90% think rideshare drivers are trustworthy. So transportation as a service, that's gonna continue on. Um, this is me in Minneapolis a few weeks ago. I was up at the ITE uh, meeting. I ate breakfast in my downtown hotel. There was one of these bike share stations right outside and I downloaded the app while I was eating my eggs and flashed up and it was $1, $1 to go rent a bike for, I don't know, half the day or something crazy. So I said, yeah, I'll do that, boom, boom. Went out, jumped on a bike, drove all downtown Minneapolis, bike lanes, looking at signals. I was taking videos and pictures as I was riding along. I mean, it was awesome. Got all over the city for a dollar. And then I docked it at some other thing. I stopped and had to take a picture of the stadium. And then there's people zooming all over on these scooters. Same thing, right? Just dropping them anywhere. Dollar, dollar, super easy, app-based. Um, don't have to own anything. I live downtown, just super easy to get around. So transportation service, these kind of things on the huge uptick and here's why. Because if you look at all the data, 60% of the trips that we take are less than five miles, right? 60% of the trips we take are less than five miles, okay? Five to 15, medium distance, so Uber, and then hardly anything we do really requires car ownership if you stop and think about it. So the economics of that, which this guy back here knows way more about than me, um, there is a lot of fun data you can roll up on car ownership and costs and, and data of that. So all of that crazy being said, how are we kind of trying to ready Lincoln? What are we trying to do here locally? Well, a few things, because here's some things that we know are coming. This idea of connected and autonomous vehicles, yes, it's coming. How soon? Nobody knows. We might find out here in another couple of weeks how soon some shuttles might come to our city. Um, electric and this transportation service concept. So. I mentioned signal system upgrades. We are readying, readying our signal system with the massive aloe fiber to the home project, everything connected to robust broadband network, brand new controllers, brand new software, lots of modules that are open to that SPAT data signal phase and timing information. We are readying ourselves for that phenomenon um, because we know autonomous vehicles are also coming. And whether it's this level zero or one, two, and partial or all the way up to full, uh, we have to be ready for that because that's going to impact how we're operating things. Signals and streets and doing marking and signing and the need for some of that infrastructure um, and capacity and number of lanes or less lanes, right? A um, lot of communication study going on. We're working with uh, UNL, David Young, myself, trying all the time, talking about next phases of some of this advanced wireless research, um, dynamic short range communications, and when's 5G and 6G hitting us, right? Um, lots of cool work going on in that field right now as well. Probably the other biggie, uh, electric vehicles, okay? Uh, Teslas, cool stuff like that. So the fat guy in this blue sedan is me. That's a few weeks ago at Turbine Flats. I got to go to a 
a fun little presentation. Um, but electric vehicles, man, they're coming, and they're, they're coming hot and heavy. And I just actually, I was laughing because, no kidding, I was coming down Antelope Valley, and I got in that long left turn lane with the new longer green arrow. You're welcome, by the way. Uh, and right in front of me, within transits on, was a red Tesla. Was somebody here driving that? No, okay, all right. They turned left and went down Vine Street, and I said, aha, wow, I'm... I'm not lying, it's real. Uh, so last 10 years, and these numbers are already out of date, zero of the op automakers were having a mass market electric vehicle, an EV. Today, all of them have it, okay? Electric vehicles worldwide was a couple thousand, now it's a couple million, thousand percent growth. Charging stations. Uh, that data is crazy. Electric vehicles, if we get the battery technology tweaked and right, like Tesla is working on right now, um, you will see at the top here, January of this year, their Model 3, a couple thousand vehicles on up. Look at this, September, 22,000 sold. Those are real numbers on electric cars. So you think those are going away? Yeah, nope. That market is crazy. Um, so with that, our shuttle program, some of you got a chance to see that. Autonomous shuttles in the downtown. Transportation as a service. Autonomous and connected. Electric, right? All those touch points. Um, We've been working hard with some concepts and planning and putting those Bloomberg grants and things together to see, again, ready our system, make sure we're part of that conversation. Um, there's a lot of cool information on um, shuttle.lincoln.ne.gov. If you're curious, you can download a lot of that information talking about routes and a pilot project. Um, We've been putting together a team of people working hard on chasing build grants through FTA and the Bloomberg Mayor's Challenge Grant, which Lincoln was selected as one of their um, initial top 35 cities out of the 370 some applicants. So that was pretty cool. Uh, they scratched us a check for $100,000 and we got to experiment further. Um, we're about to find out if we're a million dollar winner or even a $5 million winner, hopefully here at the end of October, um, and if we get a little bit of injection of funding, you're going to see shuttles running around the downtown streets of Lincoln next year. So that was a cool program. I'd urge you to go check that out. Uh, this was a uh, Navia model that we had. There's several of them out there now. There's cities just like us deploying these things almost uh, for sure monthly, if not weekly, and almost maybe daily now. So uh, that's... Uh, that's getting kind of crazy as well. A couple last notes, um, you know, future needs. NHTSA just came out with this automated driving systems version 3.0 this week. I haven't even downloaded it and read it yet, but federal government, US DOT and FHWA, they're all readying for this wave of autonomous vehicles. And how do we all plan for them? And what do we do and who's involved, right? So we got to figure out a lot of things with legal beagle language and design standards and requirements and safety. Um, we got this LB 989 bill passed this last year. We went to the Capitol and presented at hearings with uh, Senator Anna Wishart, who's awesome, by the way. Um, she's fighting hard for this technology. Nebraska is officially open. We're a sandbox now for autonomous vehicle pilot projects uh, this pass. So that was pretty awesome. There's probably gonna be more legislative discussion uh, this next round, um, but we're kind of off and running. So I would leave you mostly with the really cool thing for you all about this is for electric vehicles and connected vehicles and autonomous vehicles and all of this crazy stuff, who do you think is going to define that, design that, operate that, manage that, and drive all of that? Engineers, right? Transportation technology is an awesome field to be in. We don't have enough talented traffic engineers, transportation engineers, transportation planners, technicians, fiber optic gurus, ITS people. So if you want 
job security for the rest of your life and be involved in some of the coolest stuff that's going to happen over the next two decades, you're in a perfect spot because I'm telling you, this is where it's at. And I know I'm biased, but this is really where it's at. Nod your head with me. Say it with me. This is where it's at. All right. One more. This is where it's at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're in a good chair. Okay. Um, and the other thing is the reason that we're having fun at Lincoln is these are the types of organizations, right? There's those that set the bar low and take the roof shot. Those that are reckless and take a wild shot. And then there's us. This is what we are right here in Lincoln. We're ambitious and we take the moon shot. Okay. So if you're curious, get my contact information, keep bugging your professors and people here. We're going to have lots of opportunities at the city of Lincoln. Yeah, we're a public agency. You can go work for a consultant and that's awesome too. And we'll still, we'll still do projects with you. But I'm telling you, there is a ton of potential coming up in all of these fields and even right here. So that's all I got. I'll answer questions. Um, so when you were uh, discussing about the university's master plan and stuff and doing stuff and work with 16th and 17th Street and then Vine as well, where does the conversation start with that? Does the university come to you guys with, hey, we're looking at doing this for a traffic plan. This is what we want to do. Or do you come to them? Or how does that relationship foster? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a two-way relationship, definitely. Um, you know, UNL is an awesome partner for us. Um, there's lots of discussions almost weekly that are going on in terms of projects and plans and things like that. I think what spurred this on a little bit was a uh, university's desire to um, take over that portion of 17th Street. Um, but these long range plans that get done, you know, sort of years, if not decades ago, once in a while, it takes kind of a next, next staff member to go, oh, hey, remember that thing we put together? We want to keep moving in that direction. And so there's a natural reach out, whether it's UNL to, hey, city, we want to kind of do this thing or us saying, you know, we've got a couple streets out here that we're thinking are, are old and beat up. We need to do a project on. How about if we do this, this and this? And so. Yeah, it's definitely a it's definitely a two way street and a, a great kind of kind of partnership and a and and a work back and forth together. Um, you know, it's probably similar from some of the larger users in town or other campuses and things. But uh, yeah, it's it's been good. Yeah. Um, you pointed out how three quarters of cars already have internet connection in them and it keeps growing very quickly. Are there any plans for the uh, traffic infrastructure to directly connect to the cars and say maybe reroute traffic and be like, oh, there's, you know, an accident on I-80. <clears throat> we got to get everybody over on uh, Highway 6 or something like that. Yeah, you bet. Um, so a couple things. The city is actively right now. We are one of the uh, Waze partners with our Connected Citizens program. So actually, if you have the little Waze app, just even on your phone, um, they are integrating some of our local data and our feeds from actually some of our operators that are inputting lane closures, and detours and crashes and stuff like that. They already have that linkage to our, our data. Um, but in terms of connected vehicles, so vehicles probably talking to like our infrastructure even, um, those upgrades that I was mentioning with the signal system, we have plans to do some, um, and it's probably gonna start in the downtown if we get a shuttle project, uh, some DSRC equipment. And so the new controllers that we'll be purchasing and the software we'll have, it will provide signal phase and timing data to your car um, without us even having to do anything. That linkage um, can be there. So. There's already communities right now. If you've got one of the newer Audis or, or some of those vehicles that are equipped with that SPAT capability, the signal phase and timing, you can be driving down the street and on your dash, it will say lights red, lights red, lights yellow, lights green. I mean, there's that information is, is out there and it's happening and we'll, we'll be there probably within 12 to 18 months. I'm guessing uh, some of those capabilities will be there. So um, there's 
bike apps and now there's you know vehicles talking to the other vehicles that are equipped with that or with people with the right phone apps so that whole market is uh is exploding yeah what else somebody's gotta have like a question about even like a pothole or something right or whatever So when you talk about the um, connecting at an autonomous vehicles, so when Lincoln moves into uh, intelligent smart cities, what do you think? Which one? Like, do you think either you want to make uh, the road smarter or the the vehicle smarter? Which one? Like, how to balance that? Because it would be a long distance or long journey to reach that goal. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, so. You know, you're. You mentioned smart cities. I mean, as a topic in general, that, that that that's kind of a you know a big buzzword in the industry. But there are lots of I mean, in terms of the vehicles, whether it's connected or autonomous, the there's so much sensor technology out there that's coming. There's sensors on you know street lights that Kansas City has been doing that is already showing uh, parking availability and parking turnover, and they're feeding that to central servers and systems. To people's phone apps to say when I drive downtown I know stall 17 is open um, so it's not even just so much about the connected vehicle to the infrastructure but it's also people with their their personal device is connected to some of that infrastructure and I guess that's what I really see um, soon uh, Lincoln 2 will be rolling some of that out I mean I think I think connected vehicles are obvious and they're coming first um, autonomous vehicles will will follow, um, but you're going to see uh, you know these new vehicles now. Even some of these Tesla 3s's that are rolling out on the market, they have a they have sort of a almost fully automated mode that you can put them on, which is scary. I mean, but but that's that's a thing. You can buy vehicles that will do that now. So um, our infrastructure is not ready for that yet. Um, some of the telecom companies with the, I mentioned kind of the 5G wireless and even 6G testing. Um, I think the big discussion is, will public agencies like us have enough money and funding to be paying for widgets and gadgets and things out in the field at our own locations? I feel we're spoiled a little bit. Lincoln's done a pretty good job of some of that and will be. Um, but at some point, it's the question of, will there be a funding model for that? Or will the big telecom companies be racing ahead with their really, really high, uh, robust, zero latency communications network? So will everything be sort of more of a, uh, a personal connection with a phone app or be talking to your vehicle, right? It won't be us with our infrastructure. It will be them with their network. So that's going to be an interesting thing to kind of follow along and another question top, off the top of my head so when i talk to people about the you know the flash yellow arrow for left turn yeah um left turn is so every time i talk to people that i'm studying about transportation they many of them just complaining why you guys want to design that flashing yellow arrow for left turn is because many it's confused to many people many drivers so i i told them it's they made by city of Lincoln, they did that, not us. So um, is there any consideration behind that you want to change that into from solid green to to flash yellow? Also, uh, how do you think or uh, what stage you think or you consider about the feedback from road users or communities about those? Yeah. And we've heard that question about 19,000 times, I think. Uh, so it's a great question. So flashing yellow arrow um, is a great technology. Uh, it's got proven safety benefits. It's in a lot of major cities. It was like a new culture shock to Lincoln, Nebraska. I can tell you that. Um, we purposely did not hang the signing by the traffic signal head that said, yield to oncoming traffic on the flashing yellow because I didn't want to put up 8,000 signs um, and it's really the same thing as a green ball. And so we took a little bit of a hit because that I told the guys, that's fine. That's me. That's, that's me. Um, 
But it was interesting once we got a lot of the public education out about flashing yellow arrow. Flashing yellow arrow, yield to oncoming traffic, right? That was the message, yield, yield. Um, everyone was not confused by that. Uh, I had little old ladies calling me and, oh, you know, they understood what to do on a flashing yellow arrow. The thing that we did that really confused people, and that's even dropped tremendously, but we put out these new signal timing plans. We had all these genius consultants, you know, pumping traffic down our corridors. And so we went from lead left turns to lagging left turns. So after the through traffic, sometimes we change that by time of day. Sometimes when you used to get a green arrow, guess what? At noontime, all you get is flashing yellow. Because we got really, really strategic and scientific about the absolute best way to move traffic. So we said, hey guys, hey consultants, traffic engineers, it's a free for all. Give me timing plans that move traffic the best. I don't care if it's inconsistent at 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. or off or on or whatever and lead and lag. And again, we took a little bit of a bath for that. Um, but I would tell you the timing plans and the things that we have out there are way better uh, because of that. I'm curious in about 12 to 24 months, some of the after studies and things that we'll be able to roll up with crash data before and after comparisons. Um, the biggest unknown, the biggest thing that we used to get calls about that we don't really anymore is people would call and say, hey, I'm really confused because the traffic beside me in the through lanes is stopped. So I know the opposing traffic coming at me must be stopped and I have a flashing yellow arrow. It's like, what? Yeah, the traffic beside me, I'm in the left turn lane, right? Flashing yellow arrow. Traffic beside me is stopped. So I know those people coming at me, they must be stopped too. I said, no, 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 no. Let me tell you one thing. Flashing yellow arrow equals opposing green ball. Flashing yellow arrow equals oncoming traffic. They are tied. You will never get a flashing yellow arrow unless opposing traffic is coming at you. And it was like light bulbs started to go off. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm the dummy because I think this is so obvious, but people really don't get this. So the lead lag phasing thing. And I think the idea that when traffic beside you was stopped and people had a flashing yellow, they were still wanting to kind of pull out in front of oncoming traffic. And it was like, um, that was an interesting phenomenon. But you know, we were at a bunch of television commercials. We still have ads up, the website, the flyer information. We took a bunch of stuff to the DMVs. Um, it's getting out there now. But that was uh, City of Omaha is just now installing their flashing yellow arrows. And I told my buddies up there, I said, oh, we have all this stuff. You better get ready. because. They're not doing signs either, and they're changing phasing, and they think they're gonna, it's gonna be no big deal. And I'm like, oh, just wait. So, um, yeah. Um, so I was thinking about uh, uh, the boring company and how they're trying to make it more cost-effective to tunnel like single lanes through a uh, city, and so then you can just stack the streets downward. Uh -huh. um, is there, are we, I, I don't suppose Lincoln is a dense enough city to really need anything like that, or am I wrong? Oh, man, I hope not. Um, those types of projects now, those really big infrastructure projects um, are not impossible to do, but I would tell you they're almost impossible to do. Um, one thing is cost, the other is NEPA and environmental concerns and the time lag of uh, funding and phasing and staging and impacts to a community of big intensive ripping into infrastructure is uh, kind of a dying breed. I think we're going to do a lot of projects moving forward that are sort of smarter uses of existing streets and right-of-ways and a lot less intensive 
freeways and huge expansions and tunneling and whatever. I mean, you're going to see that, you know, places like Boston and uh, really congested areas. But if more and more of this connected and autonomous vehicle thing comes and you're talking about squeezing more capacity, operational type things on existing facilities, uh, much more effort, much more dollars, much more labor is going to be spent on those types of things instead of the big dig, I think. Um, thank you. I have um, three questions. Okay. One, one is just um, a personal one. When I was driving into Lincoln, the road surface kind of made me feel like my car wasn't good. Um, I didn't hear anything about maintenance. Um, if you can share more light about your uh, maintenance routine. Okay. Yeah, okay. And the second one is about um, the Lincoln, the green light Lincoln. You, you didn't talk about North 27th Street. Uh -huh. I, I know maybe um, last year you were doing some fiber optic on that section and yeah, you um, know about that street, right? I <laughs> <laughs> um, have you, by any way, tried to see the benefits of, or do you have data right now about the fiber optics and um, the benefit of it as compared to just trying to optimize your signals in a normal way? Mm -hmm. What is the difference? Because that one seems to be very expensive okay. to me. So if you can also um, address that part. And on the... Um, the 13th Street. Um, you talked about accidents from the south going to Bandar, but in terms of um, traffic delays and queue, it's the opposite way. From downtown to south, it's kind of free, mm -hmm. but from south to Bandar, it's, the queues are so long during the peak hours. And um, I know you use accident as a way of trying to justify mm -hmm. why you use a road diet for that section. And why, and why don't you talk about so many other indicators that favors the other section rather than... Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, North 27th Street, 13th Street, road maintenance. Yeah. Uh, we have a whole bunch of asphalt and concrete streets in the city. They're in bad condition. We got a whole bunch of them that are okay. Uh, we do an annual data collection effort, pavement condition rating, planning, programming of those mill and overlay projects and things. We would love to do more. Uh, we would love to do a lot more. Uh, we have a huge revenue shortfall to get those addressed. So we've got a group that goes out and does pothole patching, but that is what I call emergency fix-it repairs. Um, that's not going to get the job done. We're going to have to have a community discussion at some point. Um, as roads continue to decline in condition about what we want to do to lift the revenue. We did a big study this last year that showed we have about a 36 or $7 million annual shortfall in our transportation revenue for street resurfacing. Um, huge revenue gap. Our entire program, uh, CIP and O&M is about $65 million annually. We probably spend somewhere in the neighborhood of $5 million annually on, on some of those true preservation projects. Um, and we need to be doing a ton more of that. And it's a, it's a dollar and cents issue right now. Um, North 27th Street, adaptive project is in design going through NEPA, federal funding. Um, but we're gonna replace a bunch of detection systems, cabinets, install new adaptive signal equipment out there um, the thing I'd really like to do is probably do a retiming project before we install that so we can ascertain the true benefits of adaptive signal um, timing. The fiber optics are mainly a communications media to get us to talk back and forth from the TMC. I mean, if we have local GPS clocks, we can keep stuff in step. Um, but really what the fiber is doing is allow us to monitor those intersections and signal performance measures. Um, routinely and then keep all of the intersections in, in step, the time clocks. Um, yeah, 13th Street. So 
We did a full on traffic study, which is also on the web that showed level of service and delays and queuing and all that. And what I could tell you is um, at A Street, South Street, uh, G Street, the other signals, for the most part, all of the before and proposed after conditions of that level of service is identical. I think during AM, PM peak periods in one direction or the other, um, there will be some increased queuing. Um, we're actually modifying signal timings though at those major intersections due to that. Um, so I don't see it as an issue. One of the things we're struggling with on that south section that we plan to do as a follow-up phase up north is construct some bus turnouts. Those are heavy bus routes. So a lot of the delays once in a while that we experience on those is when people are waiting on a bus that's at a stop that doesn't have a turnout. Um, I think if we get a few of those done up on the north section, uh, some bull bouts kind of by F Street Rec Center and a few of those stops north of A, I um, think it's a winner winner. Okay. No. So I've got to, we have to end it there, but I think Lonnie, you can stick around for a bit if you have okay. any other yeah. questions. Yeah. So Lonnie, thanks for a great presentation. Everyone else, thanks for the questions. It was very good. Join me in thanking Lonnie. Thank you.